Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we're going to be doing a little bit of a different video and I really wanted to make this for you guys because the Enneagram is something that I've gotten really into within like the past year or so and you guys mentioned in my last video, the journaling video, that you wanted me to do more videos about things that I'm interested in and things that I like and you just kind of wanted to learn more about like those specific subjects that I'm really into and so I thought this would be a really fun video to make plus I've been kind of planning on making this video for a while but I've just been putting it off because it is going to be a very hard video to make because I can talk about the Enneagram forever. There is so much to this theory that is fun to talk about and just to think about and ponder on and discuss so I'm going to try to keep this brief as brief as I can but I really wanted to make this because I think it's really interesting and it might encourage you guys to kind of like look at it and think about it and study it and just kind of learn about it because it can be very beneficial. So the Enneagram is basically a personality theory and the reason I call it a personality theory is because I think it is more of a theory than just like a personality test like you would get with like Myers-Briggs or something like that. It is more of like an overarching theory and I think that it has a lot more to it and it makes a lot more sense than something like the Myers-Briggs because it is based on um, specific reasons why you are the way that you are and then it can help you grow to be a healthier version of your personality. But I really wanna start off by saying the Enneagram, just like any personality theory out there, should be taken with a grain of salt. There's no perfect personality theory out there. You know, like all personalities are very complex and there's not gonna be one theory that is absolute truth, hands down, like nothing more to it. You know what I mean? It's just a theory and in my opinion, it makes a ton of sense because it just, it just does. Let me get into it. <laughs> so the Enneagram specifically is created to take you from an unhealthy level to a healthy level. And it is a diagram of nine personality types. So there's nine personalities that you can be. And it talks about the unhealthy aspects of your personality type and the healthy aspects of your personality type. But what sold me on this idea is that your personality traits, the way that you act, the decisions that you make, and the way that you go about living your life and the way that you are as a person is all stemmed from one core fear and one core desire. And that just made so much sense to me because if you think about it, we act a certain way in our lives for a reason. We're not just randomly who we are for absolutely no reason. Like there has to be a core part of us that makes us act the way that we act or do the things that we do and that would come from a core fear and a core desire, the thing that is the most important to us and the thing that we fear the most. And so when I realized this, I was like mind blown because it just makes sense to me, right? And the cool thing about the Enneagram is everybody, every single number on the Enneagram scale has very like undesirable qualities. You can be a very unhealthy person and be ridiculously just not a fun person to be around, but then you can also be a really healthy version of your personality and you can have very great qualities. So each type has its bad qualities and each type has its great qualities. You just have to learn how to grow from the unhealthy levels to the higher levels. So what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm going to go through all the personality types and kind of explain them, their core fears, their core desires, their motivations, and kind of how that can come across in personality traits. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the wings because you can be like a five wing six or you can be a five wing four so i'll go a little bit into wings and then i'll also go into the instincts and we can also talk maybe like tri types and things like that but i think it's going to be really fun to kind of open up discussion and you guys can kind of do your own research now the first thing that i recommend if you guys want to learn about the enneagram is to take the test but do not take the results of the test too seriously whenever i take the test i get a five and I take it like I've taken it so many times and every time I get a five, but I am not a five. My core fear is not five. Um, I have a lot of traits of the five, but my core fear, core desire is not the five. What I have come to realize through introspection and reflection is I am a nine. And that is just me reflecting on what nine traits are, like kind of how they show themselves in the world. So, you know, take the test just to kind of understand maybe what your top three or four types are, and then maybe look at those types and decide kind of from there where you stand. And you can jump around, you know, from a couple different types for a while before you decide what is yours. And I want to start off by saying if you guys are viewers of this video and you are a certain type and you're watching this and I say poor 
like personality traits that you might have, do not take offense to it. Every single type has undesirable qualities. So I'm not trying to say this to be mean, but it's just how the Enneagram is. It forces you to realize that you don't have the most desirable qualities sometimes and you need to fix it. So I'm not trying to be mean with this, it's all about growth. So let's go ahead and just jump right in to the different personality types. So the first type is one. So if you are a one, then you are considered the reformer. So the type one is very principled, very perfectionistic, very um, moral, they have a very strong moral compass, they tend to be kind of type A, and they also could be considered the teacher's pet for lack of a better term. They're the person that gets a lot of straight A's. They just hold themselves to a very high, high standard. So the type one's basic fear is to be defective or to be corrupt or to be considered bad. And their basic desire is to be good and to be moral and to be considered a good person. So their motivations are to be right, to strive higher, to be beyond criticism, and to prove their moral high ground. Now I'm gonna go into what a healthy one looks like and what an unhealthy one looks like. So ones can be very humane, they can be very inspiring, they tend to strive to be the best, so they a lot of times um, will get really good grades, they like to be successful, they like to be good, they genuinely understand the difference between right and wrong and they live up to those standards. Um, they oftentimes are very successful and they're very reliable as well. You can always rely on a one to do what they say they're gonna do and you can always rely on them to be good because that's what they want the most out of life. They want people to see them as being good and they want to be good. They have very strong personal convictions and they're very responsible so they get things done and they get things done at a very high standard. They're usually very objective and they're also usually pretty fair. Now, when you look at an unhealthy one, they can be very judgmental because they truly feel like they know what is best and what is right and if you don't live up to their personal standards of what is moral and what is ethical then they can be very judgmental and they can basically just erase you out of their life because they don't want anything to do with you they can be very dogmatic very self-righteous they can be know-it-alls and they can shame people if they do not live up to their standards. And they can also be absolutists, meaning like this is how it is and that is it and I know because I know what is right. And they usually can be a little bit closed-minded. Or if you treat them poorly or you treat them in a way that they don't think is the right way, they will be very passive aggressive and really unhealthy ones can be a little bit obsessive with other people's wrongdoings especially if they're doing wrong to them or they feel like maybe they are not treating them exactly the way that they want to be treated they can become obsessive over that to the point where they can be very mean or they can be very smug and also ones can deal with things like you know like obsessive compulsive personality disorder or you know, eating disorders and even like depressive disorders. But like I said, not everyone has these unhealthy qualities. You know, I don't want people to think that if you're a one, you are these unhealthy things. You know, those are just for people that are on the very, very low end of health in the one personality type. But the point of the Enneagram is to grow and to learn how to manage your core fears and your core desires in a more healthy way. So number two, two is my mom. My mom is actually a two and they are called the helpers. And I love twos. Twos are fantastic. They're the sweetest people of all time. And I just have a nice soft spot for twos. So twos are generous. They're people pleasers. They tend to be the hostess. Um, and they always put other people before themselves. The two's basic fear is to like be unneeded or unwanted. They fear that people aren't going to need them and they don't like to feel like they are unneeded or unloved. And their basic desire is to feel like people need them and to feel loved, basically. Like wanting to feel appreciated by others. Like they care so much more about other people then they care about themselves and they just want other people to appreciate them. So healthy twos are fantastic. I love healthy twos. They are very helpful. If you ever have a problem, you can always go to the two and they will drop whatever they're doing to help you and they will do it with a smile because they just love helping people. They will do things to make you feel special. They are usually 
people that are the hostess, so they're usually the ones cooking, throwing the parties, cleaning up after people. They always like to make sure everyone is happy, everyone is comfortable, everyone has a drink. Advice givers, you can always go to Choose for Advice and they will always like help you as best as they can and if you need help with anything, they will drop what they're doing to help you. They are such givers of themselves to others and they are just like the most kind human beings and if you know a two, especially a healthy two, you are so lucky because they are just so kind. But they can also be unhealthy and an unhealthy two can struggle with codependency. They can become very obsessed with being needed in other people's life, that they kind of muddle in people's lives, they try to dig their way into people's lives, um, they become very attached to people because they just want to be needed and so they just become an overbearing shadow on people's lives. Um, they can also be people that give advice when they are not asked. So sometimes they will go in and they will just give people advice and tell people what they should do and they just kind of like push themselves on people and people sometimes are like, ah! But that's just an unhealthy too, is they need that feeling so badly that they will find it whenever they can. Another problem with unhealthy twos is they can become resentful if you don't show enough gratitude for everything that they've done for you or if they treat you or give you certain things or they give a lot of themselves to you but you don't give a lot of yourself in return, they can be very resentful of that as well. But I love twos, they're just freaking fantastic. They make great nurses, they make great therapists, um, teachers, stuff like that, um, like child caregivers. Okay, so now we're on to threes, and threes are called the achievers. Now threes are very a very unique personality type, and I think a lot of people look at threes with this, um, uncertainty. I think threes could be a very, very um, powerful type and there's a lot about a three that I can understand to a certain extent. Threes are success oriented and they're very ego driven. They're very image conscious but they're also very adaptive and they are very driven, fearless people. So the three's biggest fear is being worthless. They fear not being something of importance or something of success. They fear just being a worthless person. So their biggest desire is to feel valuable or worthwhile. Um, they also desire success and kind of like the, what's the word I'm looking for? The adoration of others. Their motive is to want to be affirmed. They want to distinguish themselves from others. They want success. Um, they want people to look up to them. They want to be seen as um, superior. They really strive to impress other people and they want people to look at them with a sense of like adoration. So the interesting thing about a three is even though they can be a little bit ego driven, driven and like image conscious and very aware of their reputation, um, if a three is healthy they can be extremely inspirational and motivational. A really good example of what I think a healthy three would look like would be um, Oprah Winfrey strikes me as a healthy three and the reason I say this is because she knows what her strengths are and she does not run from those strengths. She's willing to be like, I know that I'm a really good talker and I know that I can mo motivate people and inspire people. Like Oprah Winfrey knows what she's good at and I'm going to do what I can to be successful because I'm good at this. And it's people that are confident in who they are and what their skills are and they can be successful at a lot of things because they know how to work their strengths to get what they want, basically. They're very self-accepting. They just work with what they got and they work with it well. They believe in themselves, they have good self-esteem, they're confident people, and when you're around threes, especially healthy threes, you feel this sense of kind of security. And the other cool thing about healthy threes is they become really good at whatever it is they want to be good at. Like Because they want to be successful and they want people's adoration, they oftentimes become really good or very high at what it is they're you know, striving for because they do want to be the pinnacle because they want people to see them as the pinnacle. They are just a little bit self-absorbed, but in like a good way. <laughs> but there can be very unhealthy threes as well. A perfect example of an unhealthy three in my opinion would be Donald Trump or Kanye West. 
um, they can become grandiose in how they picture themselves. They can think that they are the pinnacle of perfection and they expect adoration, they expect worship, even if they are not the best people. Unhealthy threes can come across as very narcissistic. Um, they can have narcissistic personality disorders. Um, they can treat people rudely. They can step on the little people to get where they wanna get with no apology. They can become so focused on what they want that they can kind of sabotage other people's successes so people are no longer looking at them, they are looking at the three instead. So they can be sabotaging of other people's successes. They can be untrustworthy, they can be malicious, and they can kind of think that they can do no wrong, even if they do do wrong. I actually think it's interesting because I see Kim Kardashian as maybe a more healthy three, somebody that knows their strengths and doesn't necessarily have to put other people down to be successful, but she knows what she's good at, she's confident, and she will do whatever she can to be the top. You know who else is Beyonce. Beyonce strikes me as a healthy three. Kim Kardashian is a healthy three and I feel like Kanye is more of an unhealthy three and they're like married. What would that be like? Anyways, that is kind of like the threes. Um, I think threes are really fascinating people to be honest. I really hope I'm covering everything in this video. There's so much to talk about with each of these and I'm trying to make it short. I feel like this video is gonna be like all over the place but I think it's because I'm talking so much that I just feel like it's all over the place but it's not actually all over the place. So the Enneagram 4, this is the individualist, and I think the 4 is very interesting. I actually have 4 in my tri-type. It is my last number in my tri-type. The 4 is sensitive, introspective, they can be dramatic, they're very expressive, a lot of times they are very eclectic, they have eclectic style. They're a little bit self-absorbed sometimes, and they can be very like temperamental, and they just have a lot of emotions, right? They have a lot of emotions and they want to share their emotions, and <sighs> creative deep people. So their biggest fear is that they don't have any identity or personal significance, which I think is really interesting. And their basic desire is to find themselves, find their personal significance and what makes them them. That is their core desire. So basically what motivates them is just by expressing themselves and trying to get people to understand who they are while also trying to discover who they are. They tend to be very withdrawn. They tend to withdraw to protect their self-image because they're not usually 100% sure what their self-image even is, so they just try to protect who they are so they don't give off maybe the wrong impression. And they tend to try to put their emotional needs before anything else. So they protect their emotions and they protect their emotional needs and their emotions are usually very important and a big part of their life. So a healthy four. Healthy fours are very philosophical. They're very um, creative people. They're usually very deep. They, I would classify them as empaths, for lack of a better word. I don't know how much I like that word empath, but based on what I've heard, that's what a four would be, is like an empath. They're, they can be very empathetic to people. The thing about fours is they're very emotionally honest. They are not afraid of their emotions at all. They are willing to be emotionally honest with others, and I think that they're so, like, inspirational in that way because I think that a lot of people fear emotion whereas fours embrace it and they use it to learn more about themselves and life and just the world around them. So unhealthy fours can become very depressive, very emotionally charged. They can also be very pity party-ish so they can just play the victim like oh poor me, poor me, everybody worry about me. They can also become very angry at themselves. They can just lose sight of who they are and they just become self-loathing in a way. And like everything can just become a source of torment. So they just feel like everything is out to get them and they can become a little bit whiny because they're not afraid to express their emotions. So they can do that and they can be very like draining for people at times when they get very, very unhealthy. And because they, you know, kind of play the victim mentality or like the pity party thing, they can turn that into blaming others for their problems. Five. Five is the investigator and Travis is the investigator. He's a five. My cousin Chelsea is a five. And do you know who else I can see as being a five? Kal-El. She strikes me 110% as a five. So fives are intense, they're cerebral, they're investigators, they um, like to learn, they're always learning new things and just basically grasping at knowledge. They are very, very, very deep thinkers, but they think critically and rationally and logically. And they also are very withdrawn and can hermit. 
become hermits or recluses, I guess. The biggest fear of the five is being useless or helpless or incapable. And their biggest desire is to be capable and competent. So basically competent in whatever they're doing. They have to know everything or they want to know everything that they possibly can about whatever it is that they're doing. So they feel competent in that thing. Like my husband's a perfect example of this. Like if he wants a new car, he will research cars like a specific truck so much that he knows more about the truck than the actual person that created the truck. Like he knows more about the people selling the trucks. He becomes very obsessive in his thirst for knowledge. There are people that tend to fall into rabbit holes. There are people that find like this really unique subject that they find interesting and they will learn and learn and learn and learn and learn and learn about that one subject until they're experts at that one subject. So they're just the very intellectual type of people. Fives can be extremely smart. They can be such good people to talk to. Like if you are, are dealing with a difficult thing, you can always go to a five and they will give you like rational advice that is very like unemotional. Like they will tell you like, this is what you should do because of this and this and this and this. Um, fives can be very open-minded. And the thing about fives is they strive for understanding and truth. So they don't usually, sometimes they do, but a lot of times they start out without having a bias and they are open-minded to new ideas so they can really understand everything before they kind of come up with their opinions on things. So when a five has an opinion, you know they're extremely well-educated and it's not an emotionally driven opinion. It's like a very educated opinion. They're usually scientists, people that pioneer discoveries. They are people that um, have really, really unique ideas. They're inventive, they're smart. You just respect, there's a certain level of respect for fives. They can become extremely, extremely cynical in unhealth. So the thing about fives is they're recluses. Fives are very withdrawn. They're probably one of the most withdrawn of all of the um, types, usually, not always, but usually. Um, they usually like to be in their own space. They're extremely introverted and fives can just completely detach themselves from people and they detach themselves from emotions. So you will see a lot of fives detach themselves completely from emotions to where every single thing that they do in their life is only driven by logic. So here's the thing about fives in an unhealthy place is if you go to them with your emotional problems, they'll just be like, just stop being sad. Like they're very unempathetic. They're very much like, I don't feel bad for you. Like you made a bad decision. Like they just lack empathy because they detach from their emotions. So they they kind of come across as very cold when they're unhealthy. They also don't understand people who make decisions on emotion or react really emotionally. They kind of can come across as like looking down on people like because they just are not that way. <laughs> they can become very nihilistic. They see everyone as just being very uneducated and they feel like everyone is just living off emotions and it's just not something that they understand very well and it frustrates them. But I think fives, fives are, in my opinion, one of my favorite types. I think fives are the coolest people to know if you know them very personally and if you're a very, very close to a five. Fives are so fun to know. So sixes are the loyalists and sixes are very unique people. Um, the first word that comes to my mind when I think of a six is anxiety. So they are the security oriented type. They're suspicious of everything. They always think everyone has ill intent. So they, you know, become anxious over their um, paranoia. So a six's biggest fear is being without support or guidance or security. Their biggest desire is to have security and support. They just want their life to be secure. They don't like to feel like they're living in fear. They don't like to take risks. They're very cautious people um, and they tend to be kind of high anxiety. Like they sometimes think of the worst scenario in a lot of situations. They oftentimes want a lot of reassurance. They're always fighting against anxiety and just insecurities and worry. So sixes in health are actually very loyal people. Um, you can always rely on a six. Like if you have a six in your life, they're very loyal. They're very reliable. They are, they care deeply about their relationships that they have close to them because they trust these people and they really want to keep them in their life so they'll always be loyal to you no matter what. Um, and the other cool thing about sixes is that they are very, I feel like are a very good group, like the lock and key to a group. Does that make sense? Like they're the security of the group. 
It's like they're going to be the ones that plan everything and they're going to make sure everything runs smoothly because they want to know that there's security in the plan. Like they're the people that kind of plan ahead. They're the people that kind of see the bigger picture. And the reason they do this is because they like the security. They like to make sure that everything is going to work out okay. They're very affectionate. They're very trustworthy. They always mean well and they always try their best to make every situation as secure as possible. Security is like the, the biggest word I can think to use for sixes. Um, but the downside to sixes is they can be very, very skeptical of everybody's intentions. You know, they see somebody walking down the street and they'll instantly think, you know, bad person and their radars will start going off and they are always skeptical of everyone's intentions. They're anxious, they become worriers. A lot of times they struggle with like anxiety disorders or panic attacks and they can be sometimes rigid because they don't like to take risks. They don't like to do new things. They could be overly cautious to where they're kind of wet blanket-ish in a way sometimes. They just don't want to take risks because they worry about a lot of things. Okay, so now for sevens. Sevens are the enthusiast and Nikki Philippi, the reason I know about the Enneagram is because of Nikki Philippi, which is why I keep bringing up her and her husband, but she's actually a seven. And sevens are an amazing type. I love sevens. They're one of my favorite types, are driven by happiness and joy, and they just always want to experience new things. Like that's them. Their biggest fear is being deprived or being in pain or being unhappy, um, that type of thing. Their biggest desire is to be satisfied, content, and happy and to have their needs fulfilled. So their motive is to maintain freedom and happiness. Um, they struggle a lot with fear of missing out because they don't want to miss out on anything. They keep themselves very excited and occupied. They're the types that are going to try a whole bunch of new things. They definitely experience the smorgasbord of life. So they're constantly like finding new activities that they want to do and new hobbies and they'll just jump right in feet first because they just don't want to miss out. They want to do it all. Um, they can be very impulsive. They're really fun people to be around. They're usually the people that carry the happiness. Like they carry the enthusiasm. Like if things are starting to go downhill, they're like, come on guys, like let's go to this club. Like we just left this one. So let's go to this one. Let's go to this restaurant. Oh my gosh, I can't decide what I want to order. I'll just order three things because I can't decide. Three things will be good. Like they're the ones that are just always so enthusiastic and I just love sevens for that reason. Seven Sevens can become unhealthy as well. Sevens can be extremely impulsive and they can be so impulsive that they make really bad decisions sometimes because in the moment they just get really excited about something and they can just do it. A lot of times they have addictions. They can get very addicted to things that like give them that dopamine or give them that sense of pleasure. So they can get addicted to shopping. They can get addicted to drugs. They can get addicted to alcohol, like anything that gives them that high they will get addicted to because they love that high. They want to feel happy and excited all the time. So they have very addictive personalities sometimes. They can be escapists, so they can just completely avoid the things that make them sad or down and they can just ignore them and they'll just focus on the good things. Almost avoidant of bad, avoidant of pain, avoidant of like lows because they don't want to deal with those. So they just try to like mask it all the time. They can have really erratic mood swings. They can go from really, really excited to um, completely anxiety ridden in the next second um, and that could probably stem from like their impulsivity in a way. They can kind of create too much in life for them to handle. Like they start taking on so many things, like too many friends, too many relationships, too many activities, too much in one week to where they can't even like handle it all and they can become a little bit claustrophobic to everything that they've like committed themselves to. So they can almost become overwhelmed because they're just so eager to fit everything in and they're, they can become very self-destructive in these behaviors. Okay, so eights are the challengers and eights are probably the hardest personality type for me to deal with personally, which I'll talk about in a second. So the challengers are powerful, dominant, confident, decisive, willful, confrontational. So they are the outspoken ones. They're the ones that will be sure that you know their opinion. They will be sure that, you know, you know how they feel about something and they tend to be very, very, very powerful in group settings. They fear being harmed or controlled by others and their basic desire is to protect themselves and to be in control of their own life. Their motivations are being self-reliant, 
to prove their strength and to avoid any weakness. And they also don't want people to see them as weak, so they always um, try to show power. They always try to show that they are strong and self-reliant. So a good example of like a healthy eight would be like a very strong like father figure in a family. Like, they like to take care of people. They want to make sure that the people that they love are taken care of, the people that they love are not going to be in danger. They want to make sure that they are the strong pinnacle of, you know, their loved ones and they want to make sure that they are safe and they will do whatever they can to make sure that the people that they love are taken care of. They're very courageous, they are fearless, they make really good leaders, they tend to be very confident and um, self-assuring, like, they know what they believe. They're very self-confident in who they are as people. They have very heroistic qualities. They are a provider and they are a protector. Like those two words are the perfect idea of like a healthy eight. Provider and protector. So an unhealthy eight obviously can be extremely, extremely angry. They can be so forceful with what they believe. They can be so forceful with their opinions that they can be belittling. They can sometimes um, grab under the belt. They can belittle people because they want to look strong. They will put people down. They can have like a dictator mentality. They can be potentially violent. They can have kind of like a criminal aspect to themselves because they can be uh, like impulsive with their anger. So they can be criminal. They can be violent. They can deal with some anger issues. They can also feel like um, omnipotent. They don't want people to challenge them mentally, intellectually, physically, or anything. So if somebody challenges them, sometimes they can become aggressive in their like desire to be in control and to be the most powerful. Um, so they can be very intimidating people. Okay, so nines, my little nines. I'm a nine, guys, I'm a nine. And it took me a long time to kind of, well, actually it didn't take me too long to come to that conclusion. For a really long time, I thought I was a five, but I'm a little dear nine. And nines are the top of the Enneagram, which means they encompass all of the personality types in a way. Nines are the type to be like, they're the ones that tend to realize they're a nine last because they're always so like, okay, I think I'm a one. No, I think I'm a two. I think, no, I think I might be a three, but I do have seven qualities, but I also have some five qualities. Like that's a nine. They can't freaking decide because nines tend to kind of encompass a little bit of everything into like one personality. But the key thing about the nine is they fear conflict. They fear loss and separation, which when I first heard that, I was like, what the heck does that mean? Like, I don't fear loss and separation. Like, that did not resonate with me at all. But once I kind of like thought about it more, I was like, actually, that makes sense, especially with how I act. Um, our biggest desire is inner stability and peace of mind. That is our biggest desire is to have peace. We just want peace. That's it. Our motives are to create harmony in an environment, to avoid conflict and tension and stress, we just want everything to be peaceful. We want everything to be just simple. And we have a very peaceful um, desire. That's just all we want, really. We like to preserve things as they are. And we like to keep routine. And we like to avoid anything that's gonna make us upset or make us feel down or make us feel stressed. So the thing about nine is they're peacemakers and they're peacekeepers. We don't like conflict. We don't like controversy. We don't like anything that, like, ruffles anybody's feathers. We make sure everyone is heard. We always tend to make sure everyone's needs are being met emotionally. Um, we just are very self-effacing. We usually ignore our own needs and desires to make sure that everyone else is getting what they need and desire. So a lot of times what you hear with nines is that they feel invisible. Like we say things that, it's like, where do you want to eat for dinner? Oh, I don't care whatever you want to eat. Or would you like a glass of wine? Oh, if you're if you're having a glass, I'll have one. Or what do you want to do? Oh, I don't care, like whatever you want to do. We just go along with what everyone else wants to do all the time. We don't like to feel like a burden on anybody. We don't like to feel like we have needs. We don't want people to know what our needs are. We're usually very open-minded and we can see both sides to every argument. So one thing that you'll never see um, 
nines do very often is have we're not forceful with our opinions like you will see a lot of nines that are um, very open-minded to new ideas but it's not that we're being open-minded because we're trying to please people we're actually genuinely open-minded like we can understand like this side and we can understand this side like wholeheartedly we can understand both sides we see everything is more gray so when we're healthy we're like deeply reflective and accepting. We're very non-judgmental. A lot of times that people feel that you are just a genuinely nice person. Like when they're around you, they can't find a bad bone in your body, basically. So here's the thing about nines, and this is what gets us all in pickles, is that we are lazy. <laughs> we have a really hard time at getting things done and doing things that we need to do and doing things that may disrupt our peace. Like we are avoidant. We do not like dealing with anything that's gonna cause us stress. So that means like, you know, talking to somebody that we don't wanna to talk to. So we can just put things off and never get things done that we need to do. Um, if something is gonna cause us stress and we know that it's gonna cause us stress, we will just never do it. We won't ever do anything that makes us uncomfortable. And I've seen this happen in my life many times. I am a procrastinator and I can be really lazy and I can put things off that I know could be beneficial for me, but I know is going to cause extra work in my life or it's gonna cause maybe a little bit of stress in my life or it's gonna cause me to have to do things that I don't wanna do. We can become very complacent, meaning we just accept what our life is and we don't work to make it better. We are oftentimes pretty introverted. We're definitely one of the introverted types. We can become very neglectful of ourselves. We can become very neglectful of our needs and desires. And we can also not know what we want out of life. We don't have a clear understanding of our goals. We don't really know how we wanna reach our goals. So that is the different personality types and I hope that I was able to explain them well. I am going to have to edit the crap out of this video because it's so long. But I wanted to talk a little bit now about wings and this is gonna be really, really quick because I want to kind of touch on everything else very quickly. So wings are basically the side of your personality that you sway to. So if you're a five, you can either sway to a four or you can sway to a six. So you can be a five wing four or a five wing six. So a good example of this is a five wing four would be like Travis. Five wing fours generally tend to be a little bit more in touch with their emotions. They tend to be more creative. They tend to be more philosophical and they really like stories and novels. They really like to think deeply about creative aspects of the world. They explore and they learn out of sheer curiosity and they just want their brains to kind of go off into like different stems of the unknown. Whereas five wing sixes tend to be more like knowledge graspers because they want security in their knowledge. Fives with a six wing have more anxiety. Their knowledge and thirst for knowledge is more based in like needing knowledge for security purposes, making logical decisions. So that's how the wings work. And the wings are always the numbers right next to the number you are. So a two would be a one or a three, a nine would be a one or an eight. So that's kind of how your wings work. And I think that's really interesting. I'm a nine wing one. I'm definitely not a nine wing eight. I don't have an overbearing bone in my body. Um, so I definitely go towards the one wing. Um, another really interesting thing too is the instincts. So instincts are a key factor here and I'm gonna give you an example. So there's three different instincts. There's the self-preservation, which is SP. There is sexual instinct, with it, which is SX. And there is the social instinct, which is SO. So you can be any of those instincts the most. Like one could be your key instinct. My key instinct is SP, self-preservation. So a self-preservation nine is gonna be different than a social nine. And the reason, and kind of an example of how this could be different, is a self-preservation nine is gonna be more obsessed with their own personal peace, how they can make themselves feel peaceful, how they can create peace in their own little world. A social nine would be more of a mediator. They would be the type that would help find peace within groups. They could mediate groups, they can mediate people, they can make sure that everyone is getting their needs met and their voices heard. So that's more of a social nine. So as you can tell, instincts can play a huge difference with how 
you are in that personality type. I am self-preservation first, sexual second, and then social third. So I'm just not a social person. <laughs> So then there are tri-types. Now tri-types are one of those things that not everybody who is into the Enneagram necessarily believe in, um, but the reason I tend to believe in tri-types is because I don't feel like everyone has one fear in life. Like I feel like I have more than one fear or more than one desire. I feel like my nine desire is definitely the strongest. That's why I consider myself a nine and that's why I act the most nine is because that's how I tend to make decisions. But I do feel like I am also a five and I'm also a four. So I consider myself nine, five, four um, because I do feel like those can be like other like smaller fears and desires that I have. I don't consider myself a full five and I don't consider myself a full four, but it's more like background numbers, like subtle fears that I might experience that might cause me to act a certain way. That is it, you guys. I hope this video was kind of helpful. Like I said, the reason why I love the Enneagram so much is because it bases our behaviors on our fears and desires. And I think that that just makes so much lo logical sense to me because I think it explains why we act the way that we act why we behave the way that we behave and do the things that we do and make the decisions that we make because they're based on a core fear and desire. It just makes sense, doesn't it? So I really like this whole setup. I think it's very interesting and I love talking about it with people. There's more to it as well. Each number can integrate into another number. Like for example, I'm just gonna say this quickly, nines when they're very, very healthy integrate to a healthy three. So a nine that is really healthy, they can take qualities of a healthy three and they can grab from the healthy three when they're really healthy. But when a nine is very unhealthy, they can grab from an unhealthy six. So we can take on a few little characteristics of an unhealthy six when we are very unhealthy. So that's a whole nother thing, but that's another really interesting topic as well. But it's so like intricate and detailed and fun and just the theories that you can come up with is just really, really cool. So I highly recommend it. I've definitely learned a lot about myself um, through learning about the Enneagram and how I can overcome some of my biggest fears in life. Um, why I am as lazy as I am and why I'm such a procrastinator and why I tend to be kind of complacent in life at times. Um, I have also learned to kind of let my voice be known a little bit more. Um, not be afraid to show my vulnerabilities and to show people my opinions and not be afraid to let people know that I exist and that I have um, a say and I have things that I want and things that I desire and I have learned not to just suppress them and not tell anybody about them and I've learned to kind of help myself feel less invisible. So it's just a really fun thing to kind of look at and I would like to hear down below what you think you are as far as personality type. If you know what you are, if you've done a lot of research on Enneagram, if you plan on taking the test, I'll leave a test below. Like I said, don't put too much emphasis on the test. Take your top three that you think that you might be or the, the highest score, I guess I should say, for your test. And then maybe look at those three and then decide from there, kind of, if your behaviors match up at all and if your fears and desires match up. Um, but be honest with yourself. Like, you may be like, oh my God, I don't wanna be a four. Like, am I really a four? But if you're honest with yourself and you say, you know what? As much as I don't wanna be this certain number, I am this number and now I can use it to better myself and be a healthier version of that number. So anyways, this video is getting so long and I've had to import the footage onto my computer like three or four times already because my card keeps getting full. So I apologize for the long video, but I thought this would be really fun. Hopefully I did the Enneagram justice. I tried my best. I probably forgot about a lot of things, but um, let me know if you guys want maybe another video on this. Maybe I could do an Enneagram Q&A if you guys want me to do that. Um, but yeah, I hope this was kind of helpful. So I'll talk to you guys in my next video and I hope you guys have a really good day. Bye.